Welcome back to Most Amazing Top 10. Here are the top 10 crossbreeding experiments from hell, part two. Yep, we're just grabbing some animals and see what happens. Let's dive in. Starting our list off at number 10, the turkey fake out. Okay, this one is pretty hilarious. I have to start off our list here, especially in a dark list about crossbreeding, come on. Back in the 60s, turkey biologists in Pennsylvania thought, you know what, what if a male turkey was in a room with a fake turkey? Yeah, a fake female turkey. Would he try and flirt with it? Would he, I am legend, this fake turkey? What would happen? Well, the answer is yes. These male turkeys would try and mate with a fake turkey, which is funny, but by the end of the test, they were really surprised more than anything. They would just have the head of a turkey on a stick and these dudes still came out like, hey, what's going on? You single? What's up? <laughs> what's happening? It didn't matter. It was just the head and the rest didn't matter. The sticks chicks over here are catching every turkey's attention, but why? Why don't they care about the body? What's going on? Like biologically, this makes no sense. The scientific conclusion here, yes, there was one, was that the turkey fixates on the head when it comes to finding a mating partner, which is honestly pretty sweet. They're holding eye contact the whole time, even with their bobby weird heads. They're still like, hey, it's just you and me. Let's talk. Number nine, the gastric brooding frog. Okay, now we're back. Now, immediately back to business. Crossbreeding and gastric brooding. Okay, we're getting scientific now. I'm a big fan of frogs, except for when they hatch eggs out of their back. We don't like those. Our editors also don't like those clips either. I found out the hard way. I'm like, yeah, insert clip of a frog coming out of other frogs back from 129. They're like, please God, no. So, bless your soul. Give the thumbs up for our editors today. Thumbs up for all of our editors today. We give them horrible, horrible links they have to put together and make into art. These frogs, not so bad. These frogs would swallow their eggs and they would hatch them out of their mouth. Honestly, they're fascinating creatures. And with the recent Lazarus Project, scientists are trying to bring the Australian gastric brooding frog back from extinction. So we can see, wah, we can see all that again in person. We can see them, honestly, I think the back stuff's better now that I think about it. A frog coming out of a mouth, ooh. It went extinct back in 1983, but scientists have now figured out how to implant dead cells into a fresh egg from an entirely different frog species. Yeah, just zombie frogs, I guess. Zombie frogs that give birth through their mouths. Do we know what we're doing here? Sounds weird when you say it out loud. Uh, but, but, but. Amphibians are declining worldwide, so if we can get these guys out of extinction, we're looking good. We're looking better, rather. Number eight, Martha. Look, I like to keep it light, so I have to include my girl Martha on this list. The passenger pigeon, she once flocked over the skies of Canada. This was back in the 19th century. Billions of these bright orange pigeons would paint the skies, and rumor has it, they would fly in flocks so large that it would block out the sun for a short amount of time. Beautiful, could you imagine? Flocks that block, we love it. But only a few decades passed, and passenger pigeons are now no more. They're entirely extinct. Sad stuff. Very last passenger pigeon, her name was Martha. She passed away in the Cincinnati Zoo back in 1914. So we took a look at her DNA to see if Martha held any secrets to their extinction and we found a key. Possibly we could bring Martha back. I don't know why I did that, it's pretty dark. Like a little bird, <laughs> wouldn't work at all. They discovered Martha had a low genetic diversity for such a growing population. Natural selection and hunting eliminated arguably the nicest looking pigeon. The last one died in 1914, but in 2019, paleontologists found remains of the pigeon in protected indigenous lands in the Northwest Territories. So now we have hope, right there. They blended passenger pigeon DNA with Archaeoteryx dinosaur DNA. Yeah, we're bringing back pigeons with a touch of dinosaur. I'll say it again, on one hand, yeah, that's, that's great. I'm glad science is allowing us to try again, but look at the pigeons we have now. What's gonna happen to these guys? They're hardcore. Pigeons now will walk onto the subway. They'll ask you what time it is. They don't care. These graceful birds from the 1910s, I don't think they're ready. That's like a back to the future. That's like hot tub time machine type. I'm like, ah, uh, you guys won't get along. Number seven, woolly rhinoceros. Since I mentioned the revival of woolly mammoths in part one, what better time to mention this hairy beast? The woolly rhino, okay. I oddly want to pet him, weirdly. Once upon a time, these rhinos were common throughout Europe and Asia. They were all prepared for the cold tundra, hence the fur, the thick blanket of fur. Just like the woolly mammoth, right? They adapt to survive. So no ice age will stop this rhino. Ideally, that was the, that was the plan. I mean, it didn't help them out entirely, but it was mostly humans needing food and warmth that led to their extinction. So cut to 14,000 years later, we're trying to apologize. We're trying to make it up to them by bringing them back to life. It's a little hotter now, good luck. The same company responsible for the Mammoth Project is also trying to bring back this hairy boy. I mean, yeah, again, I'm all for science, but 
If these species died out that long ago, will highways help them? Imagine running into one of these. Number six, Megatherium. We talked about bringing back woolly rhinos and woolly mammoths, so what other Ice Age cast members can we potentially see on the highway? Perhaps the Megatherium, aka the giant sloth? I, why are we doing this? What if this works? We don't want to see this. Sloths used to be a lot bigger than we think, folks. We often laugh at them for being slow and stuff. The movie Ice Age, sure, it didn't help their case. But we learned, we learned stuff. Like the dodo bird, we're bringing them back. Sloths, we're also bringing them back. Of course, the giant ground sloth is closely related to our modern three-toed sloth. But luckily for us, today's sloths aren't the size of an elephant. That would be a horror film if we brought these back. Like, let's just leave normal sloths. We may be able to bring this one back, although they died off thousands of years ago due to DNA samples. Yeah, we got some DNA samples extracted from their hair remains, so the next step now that's waiting for us is to develop a fetus in an artificial womb. That's the hard part, but we're very close. Too close, I'd say. Stop. If you're working on any, you know, Megatherium science projects, just, you know, chill. Just chill out for a bit. Number five, spider art. For a nice halfway point here, I have to mention NASA's 1995 spider test, which sounds really scary, but it's not that bad, hear me out. When nature meets science, we often get jarring results, be it hybrid animals, clones, you name it. Spiders, as fascinating as they already are, can be even more mysterious, especially when they're exposed to mind-altering illicit substances. Yeah, just some hardcore stuff. NASA wanted to determine the toxicity between said substances and what differences they may look like. Spiders are fascinating. We can literally see how they think and survive. We see it up close when we walk through them and go, oh, ew, ew, gross, but we never see them like this, right? Caffeinated behavior is all over the place. It doesn't look like a normal spider at all, but with hallucinogens, it's the same shape, but it's almost missing steps, right? Little differences between all these tests. I don't think any animal should have coffee, period. I don't think an espresso goes well with any bug. Yeah, trust, trust me. I'm all jacked up on coffee right now. The moa. This New Zealand bird went extinct about 600 years ago, and I'm pretty glad. They're absolutely terrifying. They were flightless birds, uh, massive, hence the flightlessness, and archaeologists first discovered a fossil in a cave. Its flesh and everything was still attached. It looked something out of a horror movie. It was terrible. These ancient birds would reach around five or six feet tall, and when you think of dinosaurs, you probably think, oh, that's, that's quite petite. No, this is horrible. The birds stopped flying right after these dinosaurs went extinct. According to biologist Matthew Phillips from the Australian National University in Canberra, these birds safely roamed the land after they didn't need to make, you know, daring dinoscapes. So they got fat, they walked around, they stopped flying, and they just retired. Then they would hang out in caves and just eat good. Phillips says this is an advantage when it came to birds and evolution because wings, big or small, kill energy. So it might seem a little depressing to watch a creature, yeah, lose the ability to fly, but it's because they're eating better, right? Eh, I would rather eat really well than fly, to be honest. I can't even fly now, and I'm like, eh, I'd still rather just eat a lot. Again, why are we mixing DNA of a dinosaur with new birds? This is where we turn into Jurassic Park. Any minute. Next year, I'll be like, hey, top 10 animals that made the test and now we're screwed. Number three, the stellar sea cow. Stellar indeed. Yeah, the stellar sea cow was named after George Wilhelm Steller, who discovered this massive creature back in the mid 1700s during the Vitus Bering's Great Northern Expedition. They found her right after the crew became shipwrecked. What a lovely little surprise to an otherwise horrible situation. They were all over the place two million years ago. They were no match for humans at all. They only swam around a meter deep, and once humans came into the picture much later, they were very easy to hunt. They were fat little blubber balls just that would sit in shallow water. I mean, come on. You just... George Steller commented that the animals had an uncommon love for their families, which made it even easier to hunt. Considering the one year gestation period, the species couldn't reproduce fast enough to keep up with our hunting. But with this list, we have a little hope, right? That's why I'm here. Hi, now you're sad. I'm here to make your day a little happier. Scientists were able to sequence the genome, which means that we may see these creatures very soon, one day. Hopefully soon. The answer may lie in the DNA of a dugong. Yeah, dugongs are the cow of the sea, so what better relative to kind of pick apart and maybe crossbreed. Number two, the mouse with an ear on its back. And we're right back to horrible stuff, okay. If we ever reboot Stuart Little, this guy needs to audition, he's killing it. The mouse with a human ear, folks. This is like the world's greatest mouse spy. This is horrible. What are we looking at here? Why did someone do this? Well, back in 1997, this mouse became the test subject to determine if scientists could grow cartilage using chondrocytes, AKA cells from a cow. 
Well, it worked, and we're still talking about it, obviously, because it's the weirdest thing I've ever looked at. Yeah, Joseph began designing human organs, and this was during a shortage where human organs wasn't just like, you know, common, easy thing to get. He wasn't just bored and, you know, started making ears. He was, he was changing the medical game, okay? And little did he know he was about to change the science game as well. He constructed an ear, a fake ear, and then told his brother Chuck and his partner Bob not to bring up the fact that he attached said ear to a mouse. But Chuck, obviously, because of what happened, he, he spilled the beans, he told a few friends. But now, we all know how cow cartilage can create cells, so a little secret became great science. I really want to Q-tip his back. Is that weird? I want to Q-tip the mouse with an ear on its back. Ear. Back. And finally, number one, the multi-dog. Okay, crossbreeding experiments from hell. Let's finish on a really messed up one. The multi-dog. This was back in the 50s when a Soviet scientist, Vladimir Demikov, created a well, a multi-headed dog. Time Magazine covered it, of course. This is a feat in science. As cruel as it is, of course, this was a big deal. The adult dog had a newborn pup grafted to its neck. So when it grew, it could survive off the blood of the main bigger dog. The body, for lack of a better term. When observed, the puppy did have its own characteristics. It was playful, it was growling, it would lick people's hand and stuff like that, just as the other dog's characteristics would be, in its own unique way. It's a sad 1950s Soviet animal experiment, so of course the animal didn't survive a long time, but crossbreeding experiments from hell, that's, that's why we're here. This is the note that we're gonna end on. And I hope you enjoyed this list. I hope it wasn't too dark, my gosh. It's hard not to be grim, referencing a two-headed dog, but I tried my best and we did it. There we go, we made it. I've been your host, Taylor McWaters, and we'll see you next time on Most Amazing Top 10. Bye. I just like doing that sound. It's like that guy from Mario, where he like, he gets like the, the spike frog, or like the, the spike guy. What's his name? I think his name is Spike. He gets a big spike ball, comes out of his mouth, he just pukes it up. More disgusting animals, here we go. That should be the intro, right there.